is uh, something that just surprised the whole world. It's a big challenge to the existence of Europe and to the history of Europe. The only war we are at at this moment is the war against the pandemics. Decretar el estado de alarma en toda España. But we will continue to do everything. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're based. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you and thank all the participants in the session who have joined this project. We are living all over the world and, of course, also in the travel industry. Before introducing our today's speakers, let me move forward. Uh, Forward is an uh, international community and a space for debate and uh, share knowledge and, of course, uh, new ideas and new businesses. But above all, uh, we are trying here, uh, we are trying to find answers to the most urgent uh, questions of our industry. And, and these urgent questions about our industry are now related with COVID crisis. This is exactly the reason to be here today with the brightest minds is in minds and uh, as um, Nick Pilbim, the director of divisional trade shows retravel exhibitions. Nick Pilbim is the divisional director for Reed exhibition travel division, which includes uh, the global portfolios or leading brands such as a World Travel Market, ABTM, and um, international luxury travel market. Nick joined Reed, uh, Reed exhibitions in January uh, 2015 bringing with him over 15 years of FTSE 100 experience in the travel industry for his previous roles in British Airways and Avios. At Reed Exhibitions, he's responsible for over 20 uh, travel industry ev events taking place throughout the year in Europe, in the Americas, and Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Welcome on board, uh, Nick. Thank you, Fabian, great to be here. Odilab, President Iapco, uh, joined Keynes in 2013 as AVP Marketing, bringing more than 15 years of marketing experience in the market in the, to the management team. Oris expertise uh, includes implementing marketing, marketing strategies, ATVL, ETL, and leading digital companies in online and social media channels. In 2020, he was announced the president of International Associations of Professional Congress Organizers. And uh, Hori holds a BA in Statistics from the University of Haifa and the MBA from the University of Derby, UK. Welcome aboard. Thank you, thank Hori. you for having me today. Pleasure thank to you. have you here. And uh, for last but not least, Eric Motard, founding partner and CEO of Group Evento Plus. Graduated from HEC in Paris, Eric was working in a management consultant, Deloitte, Roger Bergen, Olive Weinman, before founding Evento Plus. For 20 years, he had led the, tra the trade media company dedicated to the meetings and even industry in Spain. Websites, magazines, awards, trade shows, work. Of CTC, as well as managing for 10 years in the IBTM world show daily. Now we are done with the introductions uh, about and about to start the discussion. Please let me send a kindly request for all the uh, all the participants and watchers and people that is watching us to donate as much as possible to World Central Kitchen, Chef uh, Jose Andres. To help them work across America and Spain to safely distribute individually packages, fresh meals in communities that need support for children and families to pick up and take home, as well as deliver it to seniors who cannot venture outside. 
please, Eric, uh, all of you, you are now the lead, leading. Thank you, Fabienne. A pleasure being in such company um, in an especially important moment where, where conversation is more important than, than ever. Um, we are in, in, in major turmoil, and in those cases, I'm sure every one of our uh, listeners will be happy to know your views of what can happen now. I think nobody has a crystal ball, and we won't expect that from you. But um, how are you um, tackling this uncertainty about the future? What scenarios are you are you working on? Or maybe you know when we can start organizing big events again. And in that case, tell us the answer. But if not, tell us what scenarios you're, you're working on. We'll start with uh, Ori before, uh, before going to get the next point of view. Ori. Yes, thank you, Eric. Of course, I know the answer, but I won't share it because I want to be the only one who knows. But no, I'm joking. Uh, I mean, the. The situation is very dynamic. I think what we have known three weeks ago is completely different from what we know now. And therefore we are, um, you know, the decision-making process is is very different from our day to, normal day-to-day. -day. So if, for example, we have uh, started postponing events from March to July, not really realizing that it's not gonna happen in July. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna postpone the meeting again? Are you going to turn it into virtual? Are you going to cancel it altogether? So um, what we are doing is for every conference, for every brand, we have more than a plan B. We have a plan B and C and D. And uh, of course, we all hope that we, we need to work under some, some sort of an assumption. So we do work under the assumption that by hopefully end of September, October, we're going to have physical events again. So once we've able to postpone an event, to later, uh, to later this year, we also have a plan how we can turn it into virtual, if possible, or postpone it to next year. So, in a dynamic situation, you have to be to be able to make a dynamic uh, decision-making process. Therefore, you have plan A, B, and C for for every one of them. Okay. Are, are there any uh, large the request for new events, significant size? Now let's say thousands um for when do they come do you get new requests for september october or uh, is it is, is this area already an area where nobody people can maintain their event uh, waiting for news but nobody plans anything new are there any new requests for 2020 or is it really already 2021 uh, if, if I mean, there's nothing for 2020 uh, for, from, I mean, for the association, more of, I, I work for Kenneth Group and in Kenneth Group, most of our clients are working uh, yeah, for yeah. PCO. So we work with them on a long term and we go with them whenever they go on a global scale. So uh, for us, uh, of course, we are talking about uh, 2021 uh, and, and for, for new clients, bids coming in, it's probably for 2022 and onwards. Okay. Perfect. We will move to the the, the virtual uh, topic that you just raised because obviously there's a lot to be said about this. We're going to move on to to Nick. Um, obviously, there's something big for the end of the year uh, that we all hope is is going to take place. Uh, how, how do you work? And you you got shows all over the world. So uh, besides IBTM World, I'm sure you you're working on scenarios about uh, what what shows can take uh, place safely. What uh, what scenarios are you working with? Well, um, just before I start, I, I just want to say that, you know, on behalf of Read Exhibitions, um, I, I probably everyone on the panel here today, all of our thoughts go out to all of those people around the world affected by COVID-19, um, our travel industry professionals that have seen their business just disappear overnight, and it's extremely difficult. And also the, the health workers, you know, on the front line in the hospitals, they're doing an amazing job. So I just wanted to, to say that. So a bit like Ori, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I think there are two things to look at. One is, is the history. So the historical data that, that we look at shows that the travel industry is very resilient. So I think, you know, a lot of the publicly available um, predictive analytics models are showing that there's going to be a sharp contraction in travel generally. I think that's fairly obvious, but followed by a sharp recovery. And I think different segments will recover at different paces, but generally in history, travel is resilient and recovers quickly. So that's something to be optimistic about in these, uh, the, you know, these very, very difficult times. 
Uh, the scenarios that we're running are very similar to Ori. We're using plan B, A, B, C, and D sort of every day of the week at the moment. But what we're hearing from our clients, which is, I think, another thing to look at, we have three very large shows at the end of the year in Q4, uh, one large leisure, one large mice, one large luxury travel show. And all of our clients are unanimously saying to us, they really hope that we can run these events because they want to come back to business, they want to get back to doing deals, they want to really work on, work together on sharing best practice for the recovery and rebuilding for 2021. So it's no guarantee that they will happen, um, but I think the sentiment in the industry is H1 is a, is a major problem. Q3, you need very good contingency plans, like Ari says, for Q4, let's hope we can run and the industry is right behind us in, in wanting to run at that time if possible. One last one of, of forecasting uh, dates, but it's a very important one because you guys run big uh, events. Um, sometimes you hear, oh, they're going to enable uh, small events, uh, not large events, which always looks uh, a bit strange to me because I'm telling myself that if you uh, enable, if you allow uh, groups of 100 together, uh, a lot of groups of 100, uh, human activities such that a lot of groups of 50, 70 uh, will gather for a family dinner or whatever, or, or even smaller groups. And if you think that the virus can start spreading again, uh, I'm not sure the other danger is, is events of 2,000 people. I think the danger is, is everywhere in daily life. Um, are you working with this with a scenario? Or do you see any likelihood in the scenario that large events will be forbidden for a quite a long time and we're going to start with events of uh, 50 people of 100 people is is this a, a credible scenario for you too who will take this one um i can start with that i think in terms of the, the scenarios um for later in the year i think there is some speculation that from a lockdown's point of view that there might be um some sort of social distancing that will carry on into the second half of the year in some major markets uh, but there are some markets that are talking about on off for the lockdown, which is quite challenging to plan for. Um, in, in terms of you know our, our events we're planning for quite large scale. so to to start off very small, I think it'll be it'll be challenging. So I think it's a case of either running you know a very viable, valid, high return on objectives event, or if not, looking at your other options and contingency plans. So currently, you know for the larger events, we don't see it as a viable option to run you know very small ones. Um, I think the other thing from a scenario planning point of view, one of the more emergent issues is venues, particularly the larger venues being taken over as field hospitals. I think it's an interesting development and we'll, we'll see how that pans out. It's not something that's happened very recently. So I think we need to watch how that happens because that could influence the availability of space for the larger events in, in many markets. Yeah, we'll see how long it makes sense. Yeah, right. Yeah, so first of all, I, uh, I, I want to add and I totally agree with what Nick said. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, what, a few of our conferences are planned to venues that has uh, become a field hospital and therefore had to cancel. And of course, this is totally understandable and this is the need of the time. Um, uh, the second thing, comment I wanted to make, and, and I fully agree that uh, for large scale association, even mid sized association that are running a 2000 event uh, uh, Congress, for them to do a, a smaller event of a smaller scale event for 600 people, it's, uh, um, it's a damage to their reputation. So they will uh, avoid having a smaller scale Congress. Um, so they either will turn virtual or cancel or postpone and having a, a smaller event. And, uh, and, and of course the physical event will have probably uh, take a different shape or form than what we've used to, at least in the long term about you know social distancing. Can we put 4,000 people in one plenary hall? All those open questions that we'll have to face very soon. see credibility in, in the idea that I, I know we have to be prepared for everything you see credibility in the idea that we will have to run events with social distancing because it, it looks a bit like uh, against the very nature of event to have the possibility of going to talk to somebody and say hi and, and then shake his hand or her hand or uh, but that's one of the, one of the scenarios you're working with is that uh, the the, the the legal capacity of places is going to be divided by three because you're going to have to be one one and a half meters from from uh, from somebody else. Uh, 
doesn't it kill the very nature of events? You, it's a it's credible scenario for you. I, I, I guess it's too soon to know. I, on a personal level, of, of obviously I will be missing the the social close interaction of you know uh, we are in the meeting industry that we all like to hug and kiss and and socialize with everyone. Uh, and this will be missed. I guess this uh, it's also about the resilience and how much time it will take to fully recover from that. And uh, maybe it will take a while, but there is a need to meet uh, for sure. I mean, we see, we deal with a lot of medical associations and science, and this is how science develops. And this is our technology progress. So we will find the best solution uh, in order to facilitate the face-to-face the -face meeting for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that travel, tourism, and, and events are um, they, they, they share a, a fundamental foundation hospitality, which is fundamentally a human experience. So I think you know what we're hearing is that there. I think particularly after everyone's been through this lockdown and working from home for a long time without much human contact, that there's going to be a real pent up demand to get back to doing business face to face. So like Ori, you know, planning for events with social distancing, I think it's too early to tell because also it, it's the total ecosystem of having an event, people traveling to an event, staying at hotels locally, transport, taxis, restaurants. So social distancing would need to be considered across all of those factors. So I think it's a little bit too early to tell uh, and we'll see how that pans out. And again, it may be different in different markets. So the strategy is different countries are taking on how they're limiting their events, social distancing, evening curfews, all vary. So I think we need to wait closer to the time. Ori said very early on, you know, week is a long time right now. So to look at, you know, late towards the end of the year, how that's going to pan out, very hard to tell. Um, okay, without uh, saying if you guys think it's likely or not, it looks like the two of you consider that it's one of the scenarios that we have to work with, uh, that events will need some social distancing. It, it, we have to at least as professionals consider that this is one thing we should be ready for. I think for a scenario planning point of view, I think, yes, you would add it to the list. And I'm sure there are other um, considerations, limitations, issues that we'll need to add to our contingency planning list um, and, and figure out some practical options, if not some full black plans. So, yes. And, and I will add that what will happen for sure is that we'll add much more live streaming and hybrid uh, solution to events that will happen in the later stages this year. Because if hybrid was a little bit of a buzzword until now, and it will always was was you know a few years ago they said that hybrid will become more and more uh, a large on a larger scale, and it didn't happen. I think now is the timing that we'll see more and more hybrid event live streaming uh, to enable people that cannot travel for any reason to join in uh, uh, any conference, event, congress um, in on online. I mean, we are now, everybody, when, when this period of time when everybody is locked down, we get used to a little bit of doing such a, an event uh, through, through uh, the internet. So I guess that people will uh, be more welcoming, be more open to join a real event from home. Uh, and we'll, we, again, we don't know what kind of travel restrictions we'll have, you know, uh, towards the last quarter of the year. So for any physical event, we'll most probably add a hybrid solution for them. Okay, well, good transition. We're going to move to, to the compulsory topic these days of webinars and uh, hybrid and, and, and streaming. Nick, um, I think uh, Retravel Exhibition has taken some some virtual steps uh, these days. Can you tell us more about uh, what you, you guys have, have planned for now and how far you think uh, a show can go in uh, making business happen online? Because we've had the possibility, the technical possibility of doing virtual trade shows for 10 years with decent solutions, maybe they're better today. Um, I get the impression that, that business still happens live. So are you working on, uh, on, on solutions that you think can make people generate business uh, in an online environment? And what other initiatives are you, are, you, are you taking on the virtual path? 
Yes, so uh, for IBTM, we, we had to, unfortunately, because of the virus, we had to postpone our IBTM Asia Pacific launch in Singapore, which the market had responded really well to. So we were quite sad to move that after working on it for a long time. Um, but in its absence and looking at the, the state of the industry, we announced the launch of IBTM Connect, which is a new platform for us, which is a mix of webinars, on-demand services, live streaming of keynote speakers, sharing content, all free of charge, to help the industry cope with the situation that we're in and also to plan for recovery and to make the most of the recovery. And that, that's quite new for us. And I think like many organizers, we've been thinking about digitizing some content or events and had to hugely accelerate those plans overnight. Um, but actually this has gone quite well. The response we've had from the market has been very positive. The, the, the delegate numbers have been really strong. So I think the digital phenomena is gonna be here to stay actually. Um, I think as a complement to events, we're also when events can't happen because people want to connect, there's so much um, to talk about and thought leadership to be shared. So I think it's here to stay, actually. And I think, like Ori was saying, both in terms of when the physical events come back, I think they'll stay as a complement and a connector to those people that may not be able to attend. So I think we'll see a real um, exponential growth in the digital platforms around events that aren't able to happen. And I think some of that will continue into the future. So uh, Connect is mostly content conferences with, with possible interac in interactions. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you working, do you, do you think the future is having a, like a virtual show where I can, I can connect with uh, hundreds of DMCs all around the world? Uh, do you think this is, this is getting closer? Um, I think we're, we're trialing different um, tech platforms and different approaches in some of our markets for read exhibitions worldwide and we're having some good results. I think it depends on the marketplace you're gonna deploy sort of virtual products to. So travel and tourism, it's not a market where you're selling something tangible with a technical specification that you can show on a screen or it's, it's, a, it's more of a service and hospitality offering and it's a total package that's made up of a bunch of stakeholders around an ecosystem to bring a live event to life. So I think to, to end up at the, and actually the feedback we're getting, to end up with a true virtual trade show for those sorts of products and services, I think will be quite challenging. Um, so I do see a, a very valid space and value add for digital, including getting to the meetings level and potentially, you know, one-to-one -one appointments, et cetera, definitely in the conference and content space, but all the way to, a, you know, full scale virtual trade show where every delegate is virtual. I, I don't see that at the moment. This will take time. Uh, Ori, you're more in the Congress uh, area. Uh, I get the impression but what what retail exhibitions is virtualizing now is more content and education than than purely uh, business meetings although it looks like uh, this this could be a future um, is it easy to virtualize a congress what what is your experience yeah, um, so first of all uh, we just ended two days ago our first full virtual meeting uh, a scientific meeting that is in the field of Alzheimer and Parkinson. This was supposed to be a, a congress in Vienna um, that unfortunately couldn't happen because of, of, of COVID-19. And the decision was to not to postpone it, but to make it virtual because, again, because of the need to of science to be heard and the progress of science, and there was a few clinical trial results that were very important to discuss. Therefore, together with the co-chairs of the meeting, we decided to turn it individual. Now, the decision was made three and a half weeks before the meeting. We didn't have nothing. So uh, with, with our IT team working 24-7, uh, we were able to, uh, to transform it to a complete virtual uh, meeting, including pre-recorded and live stream sessions, including a virtual exhibition, uh, including interaction of, of uh, live questions and meet the professor and meet the expert session and it was a huge success success and and what uh we've we have learned a lot from that of course because we're going to see more virtual events coming in very soon probably in in the coming uh, weeks or months because of the, also of the situation but first of all it's funny uh that we have learned that um uh, a speaker cannot record his own session alone which, which is, which well, I mean, there are top doctors, top scientists, but you send them a link to record this in Zoom, it won't happen. So uh, 
so we realized we actually have to uh, do some sort of an onboarding to every speaker that we are recording. So we, we join his recording, at least at the beginning, make sure that you know the microphone is working, the video is well received and everything is working properly. So we, we re recorded about 230 session presentation from 230 different speakers, which was a, an operational, uh, uh, I mean, a huge operational um, uh, challenge for us, uh, but it worked. Um, and then uh, we were fortunate to have on board all the industry supporters, all the sponsors, because uh, it's, it, uh, that's a key factor, because if you don't have the delegates, you don't have the sponsors, I mean, it doesn't make any, uh, uh, it's not viable on, on a financial basis. And uh, we were lucky to have all the sponsor on board. Now, going back to, Nick, what you said about the trade shows and exhibition and the exhibitors, um, I mean, virtual exhibition will never replace a face-to-face -face meeting, and it might be a complimentary, as you mentioned, Nick, uh, in addition. So in this case, because they cannot uh, physically meet, then it was accepted to have some sort of a virtual exhibition which we enable to, of course, to every exhibitor to upload his materials and videos and brochures, but also enable them to have live chats. So there was a person from every company uh, behind the computer chatting with potential leads. And actually, it's interesting that we got a feedback from one of the exhibitors that they had got the, the, the most leads out of the, the last congresses. I mean, for them, just to uh, uh, easily Put your name and email on the website and and, and leave your your uh, lead. Uh, it's for them was uh, they sh they showed a better return on investment than a physical one. Again, I don't think that will be the case in in, in all exhibition or trade shows, but it will be uh, in addition. But this was this was a very successful. We got a very positive feedbacks, and we actually are in the planning of turning three more a congresses that were scheduled for July to fully virtual. Okay, which is which is necessary today because people because people can't uh, can't gather. Um, I always think of 2009 when there was a huge crisis. There was no budgets and uh, several brands. Uh, I don't remember if it's Tap or Cisco, but one of these huge tech uh, conferences, global, went online. I remember a car launch, believe it or not, uh, being done online. Um, and it was that there was no budget, so that that's all they had. Uh, but they, it was on one year, and then the following year they went back to to physical. So um, I'm I'm asking myself this question regarding your congresses: when 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 it can be physical again? There's no doubt that it will be. I mean, from my point of view, in my discussion of clients, there's no doubt. They, I mean, this is only a temporary solution, and they will go back to physical meetings. Again, uh, maybe with a component of live stream to enable everybody to join in, but absolutely, we have we need to meet physically, face to face, no doubt. Yeah, and you. So you were saying already that that uh, everybody was talking about hybrid hybrid events uh, a while ago, and they didn't really deliver on their promise, uh, Nick. Um, the idea is extremely appealing to say, well, people who want to go to the event will go to the event. People who can't go to the event will be participating in participating in it remotely and my impression is that you can always stream some content and some people will see it but it's hard to say that you can participate remotely in an event because because the people who are there live just just experience it completely and when you're at home you just uh, you're just a bit disconnected what, what's your view on that do you think the future of a trade show will be that uh, Whoever can go uh, will go and have the full experience. But there's, do you see a future in the notion of hybrid trade, trade show? So there's two ways of participating. In it being sort of complementary. So a bit like Ari was saying, we've had some success on having live trade shows, but where certain segments of the market were suffering from lockdowns or travel bans, they were able to participate digitally in real time, which I think worked well because it helped both sides of the marketplace, work for the exhibitors, work for the buyers. But it wasn't you know, a full experience. And I think particularly for travel and tourism and the, the mice industry generally, the, uh, that human aspect that I mentioned and the building of relationships and trust um, to do business in the future, I think is important to be done in person. And I think that, I've been in travel a long time, but it's not just my opinion. That is what we're hearing again and again and again from large customers all over the world in all these geographies affected by the virus 
that that's one of, that what they want to get back to. So I see the digital element being long term, being complementary, but not being a replacement at all to face to face. Can, I just want to add I on what Nick said. Sorry, Eric. I just want to add on what Nick said. I mean, for me, uh, I, I wear two hats: the Kenneth Group hats and also the Apco hat. And and for me, coming to uh, trade shows like IBTM has a significant uh, effect on my day-to-day -day job. I mean, uh, and it's not about only about uh, selling, buying, and selling. It's also about maintaining a relationship. When I meet there all the, the business partners that have done business from convention bureau to convention centers to hotels. Uh, this is a crucial way for me to maintain relationship that probably can, you know, it can be done by a phone call with, but it never happens. Uh, whatever you can use, you can, you know, speak face to face, five, 10 minutes with a person. Uh, it's it can replace a month of, of going back and forth with emails and phone calls. So um, it's not only about just the sell and buy, but also about maintaining the relationship. And I think to add to that, well, yeah, we could, now, we, the way we look at our attendees, we we do we take a persona led view on um, people that come to our shows, and there are certain personas that the digital option will work well for and certain that it won't work well for at all. So for example, if you look at a, a classic trade show, there's normally a lot of events in the evening, a whole a number of events around the event, not part of the formal event, but part of the sort of informal ecosystem or fringe as we call it, um, which can be enormous um, in terms of the number of events happening around a, a sort of primary trade show. So it, it's really hard to participate in any of that part of the show, that, that sort of value added benefit on the informal networking side, on the discovery side, building new relationships and also those chance uh, meetings. Uh, it's just not possible to reproduce that digitally. Uh, yeah, if, if there are still educational events uh, with uh, absolutely amazing quantity of, of options that there are over the internet of education, I guess, I guess, yeah, this, this this face-to-face -face component will uh, will last for a while. And Ori, you were talking about leads. We could question how much is a lead, which is uh, an email and somebody quickly filling in something on the internet, compared to even just five minutes of "Oh, hi, I'm Danielle, and it's nice to meet you." No? Probably one lead is worth a couple of times more than the other. Qualifying leads is a is a it's a you know a whole methodology so and <laughs> we need a full day for that about uh, in the marketing if you have the qualified leads but i guess that uh, the i mean for the virtual meeting those two stayed uh and uh, it was funny enough i didn't mention but uh, um of course we gave we gave the opportunity for people that registered to the physical event at least to cancel for mm -hmm. a short period of time if they didn't mm -hmm. want to uh, join the virtual one and we we anticipated about a 30% drop of people, which happened. But what, what on, on the other hand, two a week before the, the virtual event started, which started on the original dates of the, we we had about more, I remember the 100 people joining in, paying full uh, participant registration fees and joining the virtual one. So I guess those who stayed uh, on board are the one who are mostly engaged. So um, I guess this will qualify as a good lead because they are engaged, they are involved, um, uh, rather than uh, twice as much people that around an, an exhibitor that not all of them are really engaged. But I guess, it's again, it's too soon to know because this is a, a new trend. And uh, as I mentioned, I think it's, it's only temporary until we uh, go back to norm, uh, but we'll see. With the mic it's better uh, let's take our crystal ball again and, and try to see if we think that uh, something will change besides what will happen in september which is that i don't know if we're going to wear masks or something like this but whatever is covid uh, related um, will hopefully be solved in a few months or in the year i don't know Beyond this, do you think there will be durable changes in events? Uh, do you think uh, there might be an impact? I mean, this has been such a shock that do you think there's going to be an impact on 
conditions of cancellation, of uh, willingness of companies to really commit to um, making decisions long in advance. Um, do you think formats of events are going to change uh, durably beyond what's legally required uh, in this in this COVID uh, space, or are we going to go back to basically the same types of events? Yeah, I think that um, I think there will be some long-lasting changes um, in the event space. I think in the category of what I call fundamental backbone, so event management, contingency planning, risk management. Um, things like insurance, uh, terms and conditions that you mentioned, but up and down the value chain, I think will have long lasting effects. Th this is causing such a big impact, people have a long memories about the lasting uh, effects. So I think that, that you'll see long term changes on that front. Um, I think the other thing is that it's not just about COVID-19. So when and hopefully it's very, very soon, the virus starts to lift in, in all these markets around the world that enables the world to start going back to normal. Um, the reality is there's a there's a long and lagging economic impact uh, for sure. So the events that are out there are going to be competing for a much smaller wallet. So winning the share of that wallet is going to rely on the fundamental strength of an event. So I think events that aren't in the number one or number two position in markets are really going to struggle because there's just not going to be the level of investment available particularly in this financial year, um, to participate at all those events. So I think there will be a fundamental reevaluation of return on investment, return on, on objectives that could have a lasting impact on certain brands. Ori. Yes, um, I, I totally agree with what uh, Nick said. Uh, uh, we all became experts in uh, force majeure and insurance cancellation insurance <laughs> and um, this this is, will definitely will have an effect on the way we do business in the future because everybody will look for more flexibility in the negotiation with every supplier uh, from hotel to venue to DMC to PCO um, and when it comes to uh, organizing events and uh, every everybody will take a stronger stand and will be more difficult to to do uh, business because everybody will be concerned to face the same situation again. Uh, so that that for sure will have will have uh, its its impact on the future. Um, and of course, crisis management uh, on the association side of things because again, I see both sides. Um, mm -hmm. Association have actually learned uh, in a bad way. How to be ready for 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 you know bad bad days, uh, because many associations that we are working with or I I, I see in the market um, do not have enough money in their reserve because they didn't plan for the future, and uh, we see a lot of associations that will be in a huge risk right now because they won't be able to afford the, the their operational cost and if their conference is 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 cancelled which is the, uh, the the biggest channels of revenues then they are in a big trouble um, so we look at the supplier side but we also look at the client side as the association uh, will also have a huge had a huge learning curve here in this uh, in this crisis We will see if we if we learn because human beings are very good at forgetting the the pain they had they had in the past. Um, do you think it will change? Uh, you you partially answered this. It's one of my my big questions. Do you think it will change our relationship with with uh, with us uncertainty? For sure, we're going to do an MBA in terms of of, of risk management, insurance contracts. Um, but something which some things which looked uh, impossible happened. I mean, uh, the World Mobile Congress was cancelled at a point where there was not officially a pandemic, but events are so sensitive that maybe even though there's not an official force majeure, the sensitivity of companies, sponsors, etc., uh, can can be, can lead to to cancel events. I guess that's one of the lessons of this of this of what we are uh, going through. So do you think um, companies will tackle their planning process and the, and, and the, the level of commitment to hold events in a different way? 
do you think flexibility will be more flexibility will be required from vendors for instance yeah i i i am definitely uh, sure that that's this this is the exact effect that we'll have uh everybody will add some clause in the contract regarding cancellations and what will happen if the event is, is once decided one sided to be cancelled uh what does it matter what does it mean for uh uh if you know be very cl clear about force majeure what will be the implication i i i guess that no, nobody put a lot of thought in it until now uh, but for sure with any new contract it, it will have you know this whole coronavirus situation will have a, a huge impact on the the future we do business yeah, I, I think to add what we're seeing in, in sort of, if you look at the now situation there, some of the crisis management that we've been going through, um, it's been a real opportunity to see how the industry can work together to get through the crisis. So relationships, for example, with organizers and venues are, are being really tested. And some are gonna come out stronger because of really difficult, brave decisions that are being made. And some are gonna be damaged if, if decisions are not, you know, the right decisions aren't made. So I think, and it's not just about the venues, it's about the whole value chain. We have DMCs, airlines, hotels, travel management companies, tech companies that power all of these events. So the reason I mentioned that, I think in terms of going forward, some of the lasting effect of this will be that, again, people have long memories. So where you know the right decisions are made that can really build reputations, that can build relationships, make the industry stronger. I think where some decisions are made that damage the business, again, they will last and people will remember those decisions for some time to come. Yeah, it's a good time to try to behave and keep your relationships and don't burn your bridges. No? Be, be a decent client, provider, partner, employer, uh, so that you're in a good shape when, when things come back. No? Yes, exactly. Um, perfectly. So it's it's a delicate question because because you are two big guys or you represent big institutions, um, but obviously a lot of SMEs in the events industry um, have the problem that Ori was talking about with with medical societies that not all of them have, have, have are financially extremely sound. You think we're gonna approach a time when when everybody will be much more paranoid about who they do business with and they will uh, there will be a premium for for large solid companies because if you work with a small agency maybe you pay a deposit that you're never never going to see again once again i guess i guess you're gonna you're gonna say the argument of the solid company but uh what, what's your view on that uh, I will start. I guess that here I'm uh, afraid that there is a short memory a little bit because uh, uh, people, I mean, organizations sometimes look uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, they look at their profit and sometimes they forget that they need to work with somebody solid that, that, that has experience and, um, and it will choose to go for the smaller uh, vendor just to save a little bit on cost. I, I hope that's not going to be the case. On the other hand, I'm, I, I also, you know, there's a lot of empathy to smaller scale, uh, mid-size uh, organization in our meeting industry that are struggling now with, with cash flow, that there are, you know, their companies are at risk. And um, again, me and, and with with my hat as IAPCO, we have uh, uh, 140 uh, member organization. There are IAPCO members, 140 companies, PCOs. Uh, not all of them are safe right now. Um, and I think this is also an opportunity to call all, all the governments to support the meeting industry, all the organization in the meeting industry, because they will need to, to uh, have a quick resilience uh, to support the economy of every country. So there they are government, different com the government in different countries that are giving uh, full support. I know that in Denmark, um, they have uh, invested 14 million euros um to compensate events that are cancelled over a thousand people and i think this is the only government i heard about this kind of compensation uh there are different ways that the government are supporting employees covering their salaries and there are some per countries that have no support we have uh, we have 17 offices across the globe i guess reed has much more and we see different support in different places and um and it's it's very very challenging uh, for many many companies 
I guess, uh, Nick, you have the same view. I do. I think it's it's a sad reality of the impact or the economic impact of the situation. I think there will be casualties in the SME space um, for cash flow problems. Um, I think different governments are rolling out different um, schemes around the world, economic stimulus schemes to to help protect small businesses, employees of businesses, etc., which which vary by market and they're very helpful and they're very welcome. I think it's a little bit too early to tell what governments are going to do in terms of the recovery stimulus and how they treat the events and meetings industry. I think it's a great opportunity. And what I've seen over the last few years, particularly with clients of IBT and World, is that there is a recognition that there's a connection between meetings and you know, economic, positive economic impact. Um, so I think that um, with you know, as much lobbying as we can, the governments will see that connection and actually prioritize that industry in the recovery. So we can get back to business, at businesses of all sizes, to running events that can drive economic impact, the creation of jobs, and the direct impact in, in host destinations and into local people's pockets. But I think in the meantime, there will be casualties and they already are, um, which is very sad to see. Maybe this is one of the best things that are going to come out of this uh, of this crisis is a renewed feeling of, of industry, you know, it, it, which, which looks like uh, started a bit in 2009 with the crisis, but today I get the impression that that there's no more competitors, that that everybody is just part of a of a community. I mean, there's no there's basically no market to fight for, mm. so everybody feels like you know, they, they are representing the same industry, and and this feeling of industry, the world the word lobbying is not a very nice word, but at least to get our voice heard from from governments, which has not been our forte historically maybe we're going to come out stronger uh, in terms of industry representation do you think something good can come out of this yeah i, I hope so and i and I'm, I'm optimistic I, i'm optimistic generally because of the historical recovery that we've seen in in the markets that we work in um i think Ari raises a good point though that because of the economic impact on a lot of our client base and the end consumer you know that the, these wallets are going to be dramatically smaller than we've been used to for the last few years so if you're budget holders in those companies, you are going to be so careful about where you place the next dollar, both in terms of return on that dollar, but also the fact you're not just going to lose it because the company's going to go bust. So I think that'll be that's going to be the case for a few years to come. That sensitivity and much smaller wallet, um, and that probably will lean towards some of the more stable players um, because it, it's it's just a safer place to put your money, which is um, I think another outcome of this situation. I, I, I would add that uh, I'm also very optimistic, so we are uh, deciding to be optimistic today. Uh, but I, I do agree with you that we are in the industry, one big community, and, and I, see, I see the support. I see the support in, in this rough times. Uh, I mean, it, it was a little bit challenging in the first few weeks because of the uncertainty and everybody didn't really know what, what's going on, what's going to happen. But now we're working with different suppliers. I guess everybody's flexible, everybody is, is acceptable of the situation, working together for, to find solutions, which, which is great. Um, also with IACO, we have conducted the, already two open calls for members to join to one big conference call uh, to share experience, best practices, uh, ask questions. So we were supporting one another, although on the day to day we might be competitors, but in difficult situation we are one, uh, we are united and everybody was, you know, uh, asking questions, okay, so what do you do with uh, registration refund policy? What do you do with insurance? What do you do with force majeure? And we just supported one another from people from from Japan, from Latin America, from Europe, from North America, and and this this really shows how we can work together as as a community in community. And yeah, as you said, Eric, uh, positive things can come out of it. Oh, okay, you're. Um... Besides sharing knowledge, do you think we're going to enter an era of, of more collaboration, uh, like active business collaboration, collaboration in distribution deals, in co-creating products? Do you think do you think this this will be an effect of the of the troubled time that people look for help in other players? Um, I I don't know. I think it's. Um... Everybody's really busy now with their own challenges and dealing with their own clients in their own uh, uh, events. 
uh, but it might come soon that there will be opportunity to join forces together and create something new. Uh, uh, but I think that it will, it will take a little bit of time because everybody needs to first, you know, first priority to deal my, with my own challenges and then maybe yeah, open up yeah. to, to, uh, to others. First priority to keep alive. No? <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yes, I think, I, yeah, I think a side effect of that first priority is to stay alive is some of the decisions that uh, are being made about events being run. So events in the first half, very difficult, move your event to the second half, but there's probably a reason your event isn't in the second half, and that's because there are other events in the second half, either your own events or other competitor events. So the calendar is, is going to be turned upside down this year. So really the question is, what are the long-term effects of that? Or actually, will we see some consolidation in the market, some partnerships that would not have happened in the past, but will emerge because it's there are more synergies rather than competing over a, you know, a small available marketplace. So I think the calendar will be quite interesting to see how that dynamic plays out probably over the next 18 months or so to see the changes this year, how stable do they stay into next year? Or does everyone go back to where they were for this year? I, I think that's one to watch. Okay, is, is there um, any homework we didn't do in the past, especially we didn't do, crises are great to question yourself, so we didn't, is there any homework we didn't do in the 2009 crisis that we should do? And maybe one sub question or one hint, um, have we done enough to demonstrate the value of what we do? It's a really tough question. <laughs> and you got, um, we got like two minutes left. So. <laughs> no, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess. I mean, from my point of view, we do so show value. We show value by working with an organization that have a professional organization working with them that can find quick solution in a dynamic environment. They can have those. Going back to your first question, the plan B and C and D fairly quickly that probably couldn't do by their own. Uh, working with our community to find solutions together. So I guess the, we we do show that we have value. And again, not only is PCO, but all this, the, the the supply chain of the industry um, and all the stakeholders involved. Um, and what what we have learned, and we'll go back to what I said about uh, international or European or regional associations that uh, weren't ready uh, to to handle such a crisis and did not plan yeah. or did not work with an association management company and a professional association management company couldn't plan properly uh, to a crisis, uh, you know, a period. And uh, they will, you know, they will suffer the most and, you know, hopefully survive to learn to manage it differently in the future. Yeah, maybe historically we were not very uh, foreseeing in financial terms, in legal terms, maybe we were still too much artists creating wonderful events rather than, than making a business run. What, what, what's your view, Nick? What do you think we should, uh, do you think we've done our, our homework in terms of recognition? Because in 2009, you remember, it was like, if you do an event, you're just taking taking big guys to a spa and this is, this is absolutely unacceptable in a moment of economic crisis. Are, are we past this? Are we much more recognized now? I think I think the industry has grown up at that time, and um, I think that the market recognises the trade shows are an efficient way to do business. It's efficient from a time point of view, from a money money point of view. You know, two or three days, you can learn the best practice, global best practice. You can meet new clients, secure new business you would have never met before. You can manage your existing clients. You can have some social informal time with all of these people. You know, that's actually really good value in two days of your global calendar and your travel budget. That's one trip. That's not 10 sales calls in 10 different countries. That's one trip. Mm -hmm. So I think from that point of view, people recognize the efficiency in the value. I think that depends on delivering quality contacts though. So the people that come to events, they've got to be the right people um, for that business to be a valid marketplace. So I think um, our events and a lot of events have grown up from that perspective. But I think to add to that, what we've learned in recent years is that's not enough. It's not enough to have a really big um, exhibition center and 50,000 people in the building and hope that they have a good event. So we've been investing very heavily over the last years and will continue to invest in very sophisticated tech-enabled analytics that power really advanced matchmaking to help drive those connections, relevant connections, 
within that trade show environment. And the results from that are phenomenal. The, the, the net promoter scores are much higher than the average net promoter score for the event. So I think, have we done enough? Um, I think yes, to show that trade shows are still completely valid and very efficient for time and money, but actually that we need to take that whole proposition forward and we're on a strong path to do that. Perfect. The future is bright. We just have a cloud in the in the coming weeks, a couple of months, but we are stronger than, than we, we ever were. Um, Ori, Nick, many thanks. It was a pleasure uh, sharing thoughts with you. And uh, be well, most of all, as Nick said, well, uh, all our thoughts to people who are having health challenges, especially. And um, and hope hope to see you in an event um, very soon and give you a big hug. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. And uh, stay safe, everyone. Stay healthy. You too. Thank you, Ori. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.